Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 27 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zeki Hassan, and joining me as always is my good friend Pervez Ahmed. Welcome, listeners. Thank you, Zaki. Uh, good to good to be back, man. It's I, 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 even though I know it's only been a couple of weeks, it feels like it's been longer. Um, maybe it was the Labor Day weekend that came in the middle. Well, Labor Day is over, and thus the new season has started. So we can consider this is the new season of the show. This is season what is it? Season three now. Uh, this would be season two and a half, maybe. You know, like a little half season in the middle. I there don't we know. go. Yeah. Okay. That, that uh, I hope you're not wearing. I hope you're not wearing white. Um. So. I, I am not. <laughs> okay, good. Um, and but, speaking of Labor Day weekend, what happens every year on Labor Day weekend? Well, thank you. You, you stole my segue, but I appreciate that. <laughs> I felt like I should help out with the segues. That, that's thank sort you of so been much. your mo, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, every, every Labor Day weekend. See, this this is this is a fascinating thing because I think for for those of you who are listening who are from within the Muslim community, you're like, oh, Labor Day is synonymous with the ISNA convention. And I think uh, those of you who are listening from outside the Muslim community have either no idea uh, what the ISNA convention is or are terrified by the notion of the ISNA convention. And so e either way, now the ISNA convention, ISNA is the Islamic Society of North America, and this is the largest gathering of Muslims in the United States, I think. Uh, it's it's a, it's a big deal. It's been going on for for literally decades, and it's a, it's a, it's a way for people from from uh, all walks of life to meet meet all kinds of uh, different uh, uh, Muslims and hear different presentations from all kinds of different Muslims. It's a fascinating. It's it's a crossroads. It's a cross section, and uh, here to talk to us about not just the Isna Convention, but uh, a variety of other different things that uh, she is involved in. We have Hind Maki, and Hind is now. I've been very lucky to, to know Hind online for, for many years now. I, I didn't know, actually, that she's from Chicago, which is my hometown. So had I still been living in Chicago, I'm sure we would have crossed paths at some point. But Hind, a little bit of background, is the daughter of African immigrants to the American Midwest. She's long been interested in understanding the impact of migration, race, religion, on shaping the development of Western Muslim consciousness. She's worked extensively within the American Muslim community on civic engagement, interfaith dialogue, and leadership development and has traveled throughout the United States and Western Europe, leading workshops on social cohesion through interfaith action and dialogue. And she's also the founder of Side Entrance, which is a Tumblr site which has gotten a lot of uh, notoriety throughout the world for its depiction of the women's sections in mosques. And this is a fascinating conversation that, that I very much want to have. But before we get into any of this stuff, uh, Hin, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, uh, Zeki and Pervez, for inviting me. I'm excited to be in season 2.5 uh, <laughs> post Labor Day, and I'm not wearing white. Uh, very excited about fall. Even though Chicago is pretty warm this week, uh, I am breaking out my fall clothes <laughs> and my fall boots and all of that. Looking forward to that. I know that can be exciting, and uh, as uh, although I'm not from Chicago, I did live in Chicago for a period of time. Uh, I know I know fall can also feel uh, feel a bit fleeting because you know what's beyond <laughs> fall, what lies yes. ahead, as it were. <laughs> not to that. not to ruin the moment. Sorry. <laughs> um, but no, thank you. Yeah, th uh, welcome, and uh, thank you for uh, for for making the time. And I, I know hopefully you have. Uh, decompressed a bit, as it were, uh, after last weekend. I, I imagine you were quite busy. Um, so, Zucky, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, actually, I, uh, I'd, I'd love to kind of maybe um, tell us a little bit about your story. I mean, it's a very interesting sort of narrative, um, you know, where your parents ha hail from and when you sort of come into the scene and uh, your, your, your background. I'd mean, love to hear that. Sure. Um, okay, so my parents are from Sudan, um, and they're from, you know, they – spent the, the 70s as student activists at the University of Khartoum, and um, from there, I mean, at that time, and actually now, uh, there, there was a military dictatorship uh, in Sudan. At that time, it was like a left-wing military dictatorship, and now it's a uh, right-wing uh, Islamist military dictatorship, so the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, but <laughs> my parents uh, actually had the opportunity to study abroad for graduate school. There was a window where um, some students were allowed to essentially leave the country, and so 
my dad, uh, it was suggested to him to, to do that. And so, um, you know, they were thinking, oh, where should we go? Uh, they speak English, obviously, Sudan is colonized by the British. Um, and so for them, it was like, well, we definitely don't want to go to England because they colonized us. That's, that's in the past. And they thought Australia is like super far away. It's like the end, you know, the end of the world practically um, on the other side of the globe. And they decided, you know what? Let's let's go to America. Why not? So they came to the Midwest. My mom, it's so funny. She was telling me the other day that you know she arrived in America in I think the the a blizzard in January uh, at O'Hare Airport wearing sandals and a Sudanese stove, which is similar to a sari, so you can imagine, um, a little sweater, and then my sister had on like a little coat, uh, I think, uh, she was a baby and she was carrying her. She comes and she's like, what is this? <laughs> this is not what she expected. Um, but yeah, uh, they came, uh, I guess, yeah, in the late 70s, they moved to Michigan. Um, and they lived there for a little while. I was actually born in Michigan. I always say that whenever I go to Michigan. It's very exciting to me, but I didn't grow up there. So I'm always like, yeah, I miss you, and I don't really have <laughs> emotional attachment, but I find out that you don't say that in Ann Arbor. In Ann Arbor, they don't really care so much for the MSU story. Uh, Were you actually born in Ann Arbor? No, I was born in Lansing. Oh, right? okay, okay. Cause yeah, like I mean, Malcolm X. <laughs> yeah, you know, no, I, yeah, yeah, that means a lot. Because, uh, I mean, I, I spent three years in Michigan, and okay. um, my daughter, my oldest daughter, was born in Ann Arbor, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Fellow Michigander, as it were. Yeah, that's right. And <laughs> Michigan is a very beautiful state. I love, you know, going there. We still have really tons of family friends who are still there. We're actually going there in a couple of weeks for a family friend whose son is getting married. But, uh, but we, very quickly, my parents decided, you know, they want to move to bigger, you know, bigger, larger Muslim community, and so they came, instead of going to Detroit, they ended up going to Chicago, and so I, I grew up here, so I lived, um, you know, about half an hour away from the, the city of Chicago, I lived in the suburb, I grew up in this suburb that is currently now known as Little Palestine, so if you look it up on Google, it'll say Little Palestine, but when I was growing up, you know, it was not that, <laughs> but uh, it, um, huh. that's actually a really, I think it's a, it's a pretty big part of my growing up because, you know, the mosque that I attended was such a huge part of my life. Um, you know, we'd go there for Sunday school and for, you know, Mu'mina Youth Club and all sorts of other activities, and then I, I attended an Islamic high school that was actually housed in the masjid. Uh, in that town, and um, so you know, all of my life I grew up, you know, feeling very much at home and at ease in the masjid. And although you know, as the community grew larger, the women's space, you know, kind of shrunk, and we were pushed back, you know, from the main prayer space back, and then from outside of the main prayer space to the classrooms, and then from the classrooms to downstairs. Um, either you know, even with that. Uh, sort of shifting of the spaces of where women prayed, it, it's still part of the, the mosque culture that I grew up in anyway, that women were part and parcel of, of the mission and so, you know, elected on the board and all of that. So, Hind, I'd love to ask you, I mean, again, you know, you, you've got two co-hosts on this, on this film, uh, you know, on, on this, uh, on this show that are, that are men and, and, and unfortunately don't see all too often, uh, don't see that part of the, uh, of, 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 of the uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd love to hear from you in terms Very of, true. Like growing up, um, you know, when does that, as a girl, like when do you first begin to, you know, like uh, sense something? Like, wait, this isn't right. Like, you know, I don't want to call it feeling ostracized, but mm -hmm. you know, where do you feel marginal, like, or or even marginalized? But yeah. just, where does that sort of enter your radar, as it were? You know, growing up, you like, know, wait, this isn't um, right. You know, the community is growing, yeah. yet, yet our space seems to be diminishing, at yeah. both in quality and in size. Yeah, yeah, and space too. I mean, um, it's funny because when I was little, like before I was, you know, before you have to pray, like you're three, four, five, six years old, you know, the women in that community prayed actually in the masala, which is, you know, the, the masjid that I grew up attending was built, purposely built as a mosque and, and as an Islamic center. So it has a masala, 
and that also has like classrooms and you know like a stage area downstairs and a kitchen and all that other stuff. So downstairs. So Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, just to, I didn't mean to cut you off, but just for the oh, you know yeah. sake of the audience, uh, like Musalla is generally the oh, yeah. prayer space yeah. within, within a particular Islamic center. So I'm exactly. sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oftentimes people will use mosque or masjid and musalla sort of interchangeably. interchangeably. But, yeah, but like a mosque is, you know, it's it's a house of worship for Muslims. It can also be, and often is, you know, an Islamic center as well, with like like the things that I mentioned earlier, like. A community hall or you know classrooms and things like that, library, um, yeah, cafe. But uh, the musalla is the actual, just like the actual sanctuary, if you will, to pray. And so I remember very vividly, you know, as a little kid running around in that musalla quietly. I didn't bother anyone, <laughs> but like you know, just being in that space and knowing, okay, the men prayed in the front and the women prayed in the back. And it wasn't a big deal. Like I didn't think it was that much of a big deal. As the community kind of grew, I was also growing older and you know beginning to pray as well. And it's it's really kind of um, it's funny how that worked out. <laughs> but I remember you know when I was like six, seven, eight, and I was like you know kind of taking prayers more seriously than I had before. That was when women started to be kind of pushed into a small like little rectangular glass space still within the musalla and I remember thinking even at that age like oh that's not fair why are we all crammed into this little you know uh, triangular space when there's a lot of space uh, in the main hall and then you know when I was like 12 uh, about 12 I remember cause that was the first year that I fasted for Ramadan and joined my, my family in, um, in Sarawih prayer you know that was like when women um, in regular prayers, we were still in the hall, but for Tarawih, because there were so many people there, we were in the upstairs classrooms with like the, the movable, um, you know, walls and everything. And there, I was, I remember thinking, well, that's that's not fair. Like the women who come on time should be able to pray, you know, in the main space, and the men who come late can pray in these sort of removable walls, classrooms. And then, you know. Well, I was like 16 or so, we moved downstairs to the basement, and then that was, then that just became, you know, I thought, okay, this is it, <laughs> this is permanent, <laughs> we're never going to leave the basement, um, and, that, and they remodeled the basement, it's very nice, it's a very pretty kind of space, the, the carpet is really nice, it's huge, uh, today that mosque is, is really, really big, and it's actually probably, I would say, uh, it has one of the best, um, you know, prayer spaces for women in the entire Chicagoland area. It has two massive halls for women, one for women with children, um, small children, and then there's a babysitting room, there's a prayer hall, uh, a masalla, if you will, for women without children. They're both really roomy and spacious, even though they're both in the basement. Um, you know, uh, and, and they're separate from like classrooms and any kind of secular spaces in, in the Islamic center. So all that to say is that, you know, even as a child, I remember thinking, well, this is not fair. Like, if if we come on time and the men are late, why why is their prayer in the mosque prioritized over ours? And I have to say here, too, is that I don't have any brothers, so um, I just have one sister. And at home, we didn't, you know, my sister and I prayed in the line with my mom, and my dad let us, but it was, you know, we didn't have this question of gender and, and sexism and unfair. This is not fair because we didn't have any brothers, you know. And, and I like to think is because also my parents didn't have the, these ge gender hangups either. No, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, again, as a father of, of two daughters myself, so very kind of similar to your um, your family. Um, you know, I'm always you know cognizant or aware, or I try to be at least I should say aware of those type of things not only at home but also when we do find. Um, a mosque to be or to to be a part of. Um, if I if I could if I could just I just want to again kind of layer or uh, perhaps add a, a, a few layers of nuance to some of the points that you were talking about. Just again for the benefit of you know if we do have you know parts of our listening audience who aren't either familiar with how Muslim community space is generally organized. Um, so when it comes to prayer time and and and, and ritual prayer, um, you know we segregate. So women pray. With a you know in their you know with with a fellow women's congregation if you will and and men uh, pray 
pray in a men's congregation, which are, of course, joined in a sense that they are one congregation, but the space is separated. Um, and so that's, I think, kind of maybe kind of fleshes out some of what Hind has been describing in terms of how the space shifted in her own mosque. Um, but now, you know, I, I think just having said that, I, I think it's also worth noting, uh, and I don't think I'm being quote unquote political or ideological here, to also note that uh, during the time of the Prophet, um, now we can argue or we can talk about why that may or may not have been the case, but certainly during the time of the Prophet, women prayed directly behind the men without there being any kind of a edifice or separation or wall um, that was separating the space. Uh, would, I be, would I be correct in saying that, Hind? That's, that's what we know. I mean, what we know of the Prophet's mosque, peace be upon him, uh, was that it was a very kind of simple square or rectangular structure that didn't have any carpeting or anything. Um, they even uh, at, at some point brought in like pebbles or small rocks to kind of have to smooth right. out the ground. Um, you know, men and women most likely entered through different doors, but you know, I don't know if there's any specific, um, if there's anything specific that says, you know, yeah, women enter through this door and men enter through those doors. But what we do know is that um, they prayed in the same sanctuary, so they prayed in the same musalla, and that the Prophet Sallallahu stood at the head of that, he was the, the Imam, the prayer leader, and men then prayed behind him, lined up behind him, and the hadith or the, the prophetic saying is that, you know, men should essentially begin their lines from the front and then fill up towards the back, and women should begin their lines from the back and then fill up toward the front, and so we know because of that, um, we know that men prayed in the front, women prayed in the back. We also know that children, uh, younger people, were often praying or playing in the middle, in between men and women. We definitely know that there was no physical barrier. And we know this because of uh, a few different hadiths, again, these prophetic teachings. Um, one of them, which is that uh, women complain to the Prophet Sallallahu because you know, I guess, I mean, obviously back then people were not wearing skinny jeans, but they may, maybe they were wearing some clothing that was maybe inappropriate for that for, for the brothers as they got up from the sujood, which is the, the prostration. Right. And so the women complained to the brothers, they're like, we don't want to see that. And so uh, essentially he changed kind of the, not really the order, but he held, uh, he, he asked the men to kind of stand up before the women did, and so that they didn't have to deal with that. So, so his response wasn't to put up a barrier. His response was, you know, to make sure that they weren't being bothered, just you know, through actions. And the other story we we hear is that you know, apparently there was a woman who was at the the prophet's mosque who was just very, very beautiful. And one of the prophet's companions just kept staring at her. He just could not stop himself. She was very, very beautiful. And the prophet, peace be upon him, didn't you know tell her cover your face or leave, or, you know, don't come back, or, you know, alter your appearance, what he did was he actually uh, told, you know, the, the, the brother and his companion to, to, to stop looking at her, and then at some at one point, he even physically moved his face uh, from staring at the woman. So we know from these two examples, as well as others, you know, that the Prophet's mosque was um, a space where men and women congregated, and in the same hall, they prayed in the same hall. Women had access to the Prophet them as the Imam, and um, that even even back then they had gender issues. I mean, a lot of people will say now, "Oh, we're not as perfect as the Sahaba." You know, like even back then they had these gender issues, and the Rasul, the Prophet peace be upon him, you know, kind of took those these challenges as they arose, as they arose, and never once, you know, did he say. Oh, okay. The solution is that women don't come, or the solution is that um, we put up a, a physical barrier. So, I mean, when when did that based on, based on your own research that you've done? I mean, when did we start seeing the, the change away from uh, sort of the cir the circumstances that you're describing from from mm -hmm. uh, the prophets era to where we are now, uh, peace be upon him, by the way, uh, to where we are now, where you know it's 
It's uh, uh, some of the, you know, as you've cataloged on, on your Tumblr, I mean, some of these, uh, these are like glorified closets. Yeah, yeah, sometimes not even very glorified. <laughs> um, well, you know, as, as Islam expanded and, you know, uh, reached different lands, including, you know, other lands which we would consider to be in the Middle East today, like, like Syria or Iran, um, you know, and then moved eastward and southward and westward, uh, people in the newly, you know, kind of, uh, in the newly acquired lands, those people already had their own um, kind of ideas of gender interaction. And the way Islamic law, you know, is set up sometimes is that if a, if a behavior, of, a cultural behavior of a people does not outright contradict Islamic law, like is not actually haram, then it can be accepted. And, and I mean, that's over obviously, Islamic law, but that's generally, you know, that's generally accepted. Unless it goes against the tenets of Islam, um, it can be accepted. So gender segregation in prayer does not outright go, it does not go against the tenets of Islam. It wasn't what the Prophet peace be upon him practiced, nor what he taught, but it doesn't go against uh, you know, the five pillars, if you will. And sure. so that then that just became accepted. I mean, especially because, you know, you, you gotta kind of win some and lose some. If you're if you're trying to make sure that people in these newly acquired lands are accepting Islam, you're not going to you you pick your battles with them. And if and if for them they want you know, gender segregation, or they want you know women to be, um, you know, in the private sphere and not necessarily in the public sphere. Then you know that's their culture, and it doesn't necessarily go against the tenets of Islam. Now, when it does go against the tenets of Islam, that's when you know um, the emir or you know the, the political leader would step up. But but yeah, I mean, like so. So historically, that's what began happening, and then. Obviously, as the, the four madhabs that are in the Sunni schools, anyway, the Sunni schools of, of, of thought, as well as, you know, all the other schools of thought and all the other <laughs> different um, iterations of Islam, you know, people, people's cultures change, time, you know, people change with the times, people change with their interactions with other people, and, you know, and then then the laws become codified, and that, but that's that's what's so interesting to me is that, uh, as you mentioned, like in prayer, men and women pray um, separately. Like we're generally Muslims don't pray in like the same lines, men and women. Um, right. But then you go around the world and you see different cultures all answering this question separately, in in a different way, which is fascinating to me. You know, some and and you see that today, you see that manifested in American mosques because. You know, America has the most diverse Muslim community in the world, <laughs> and so you, you people bring their cultures from wherever they've come from, and then of course you have the, the large indigenous uh, African American Muslim communities here as well, and so people will answer this question differently, whether it's a balcony, you know, having women in a balcony, or having women um, pray behind a partition but in the main sanctuary, or in a basement somewhere, or in a completely separate. Uh, Space, or you know, um, you know, separate from the main building. Uh, different cultures will answer this question differently, and our challenge is to identify what is it, you know, what what, what does an American mosque look like? Before we answer that question, we have to ask ourselves what's the role of the American mosque. So, so bringing that up to the creation of of your site, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. let's talk about that because uh, that that seems like uh, a culmination in a lot of ways. So what, what brought you to that point where you said, I want to catalog this? Yeah, so a culmination is a really great way of, you know, describing it. Uh, oftentimes people ask me, say, well, what is the one thing that led you to do it? And I was like, well, it's not really a one thing. You know, it was, it was a lifetime of microaggressions and, sure. um, you know, it, really, that, that's what it was like. Um, my my job, you know, at, uh, entails a lot of traveling um, and traveling across the U.S. and traveling across uh, primarily Western Europe. And because I grew up in a masjid, practically everywhere I go, I like to see the masjid, I like to visit a masjid. Huh. And um, but I can't do that because I can't ever 
expect, you know, I never ever expect that I'm going to be welcomed into a masjid. Like my default is, oh, I'm in, a, I'm in, a, I'm visiting a city. Am I allowed to go into? What is the mosque that I can go into? And wow. and I. Yeah, and then the reason that is the case is because I've been burned too many times. I remember very clearly one time, I think it was like 2008 or so, um, I was it was during Ramadan, and uh, for work I had to go to a conference in Nebraska in the middle of nowhere. Like, Well, I guess it's a city for them, Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, there's a big university there, so I figured there's got to be an MSA or something. I looked them up, and I, I wanted to know if they had Tarawih, I wanted to know if you know, they were having Jum'ah prayer, anything like that. I emailed them, didn't get a response, called somebody, called like somebody's, uh, you know, the contact information. Uh, and finally, I got an email when I, after I had already arrived. And, um, you know, they said, yeah, we do, in fact, hold Jum'ah prayers, but sister, there's not going to be a space for you, so you just might as well not come. And I was like, wow, I'm, I'm in Nebraska, in a, a place I was kind of, actually pretty hostile, I mean, for a young woman of color who was working a job. Yeah. You know, I was actually getting hostile looks from people, and wow. it was Ramadan, and I was fasting, um, and I just, all I wanted to do was be able to, you know, pray at least one salah, you know, a night with fellow Muslims, and so ever since I had that experience, I thought, okay, you know, um, I'm not assuming, like, my assumption is not that a Muslim is going to be welcoming to me. Um, and then, I, I guess, I mean, there's so many other stories, but I guess one of the, the catalysts for the actual website was actually um, 30 mosques, 30, 30 days, or 30 sure. days, 30 mosques, when, um, when they, they, you know, they, they would go and they would visit these masajid, and what I thought, I thought it was beautiful, I mean, the, the photos were really great, the stories were awesome, but I thought, okay, well, these two guys are not getting the experiences of women at all. Mm -hmm. You know, right. and I remember one time they did try to go visit a woman's section in one of the mosques because you know people did bring that up to them and say, well, you're not giving, you know, full rounded experience. Um, and I really commend them for for wanting to do that, and wanting to experience that. But then I thought, well, you know, um, most men have no clue like where women pray. Uh, you know, when we walk off to a side entrance, they don't know what the space is like. They don't know, you know, is it clean? Is it dirty? Is it no, that's an I, that's an excellent point you bring up because when you were telling your story about Omaha and, and your experiences in Nebraska, uh -huh. I was just reflecting on my own male privilege because I mean when I travel, um, my only consideration is finding a mosque where you know again that's open, that's nearby, that's available, uh -huh. and that's really the yeah. only thing that's on my mind. That's on my that's on my radar as it were. You know what I mean? If I'm if yeah. I'm if I'm in a new city. Not even realizing that for women traveling or who are in a new space or new city, yeah. uh, there's there's so many other considerations. So, uh, really, just yeah, you, you, gave, mean, you afforded me an opportunity to sort of reflect on our own male privilege. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember um, one time I was in London, England, which is a great city. I love it. Even I'm I'm this weird like Anglophile, even though I'm really bitter that they colonized the country. <laughs> I really love like I love English literature and you know just English history, and I love being in London. And I wanted to, you know, go to Juma there, and like my friends and I were scrambling, you know, to find uh, a masjid uh, that was near, kind of where I was going to be. Like I had a meeting afterward or something. I don't even remember the, the details. But like I remember us scrambling, like for days before Juma, to find the mosque that, you know, that I could pray at. And that's London. I mean, like that's not even like Lincoln, Nebraska, right? I mean, and. And so, like, all of these kinds of experiences and experiences that my friends have had, I just thought, you know what, let's just do it. And, and I guess, you know, oftentimes I tell the story of, you know, one time I was at a mosque downtown here in Chicago where the women's prayer space uh, is about six feet wide and about 20 feet long. And I remember, you know, I was just there for us, so I, I snapped a picture, I posted it on my Facebook wall, and the women were just kind of very blasé. They were like, oh, okay, like, I know where you are. The men were shocked that a large mosque in Chicago that serves a lot of people, that that would be the space where women would pray. And that's when I realized, you know, Muslim men, first of all, you guys should be our allies. Like, that's what the Quran tells you to, to be. But <laughs> if, if, if you don't know, like, where we're praying, then how do you know, you know, what 
to be our ally on, right? And so I thought, all right, let me let me just do this. And that's that's actually one of the one of the other kind of kickstarters, I guess, of a side entrance. And I wanted to to showcase the beautiful as well as the pathetic, because I wanted to be able to, mm. you know. To, to, it was really important for me to say, well, listen, there are some communities that do it right, and, um, and why not just see what what, go, what what those communities are doing, and perhaps we could implement them in our own local communities. I didn't, I did not think that it would be as popular as as it has become. I did not think that it would go international, like uh, all the way. You know, now you see people from new Muslim communities in Europe and in South Africa, Latin America, Australia, the Caribbean, as well as the US and Canada, um, who are often, you know, sharing the pictures. Because this is this is the problem. Because if you go to like Muslim majority countries, either women are totally part of the mosque or they're not. Right? And there's no there's no controversy either way. But in the West and in these sort of new Muslim communities or newer Muslim communities, the mosque is not just a place to, to put your forehead down, it's it's the community center. And if you're telling women and girls that you're not welcome, then you're telling them that the state is not welcoming to them. And, wow. Uh, so that's I think, nice. Yeah. yeah. I think that's an excellent point. Absolutely. Um, you know, our mosques, especially uh, in in Western countries, um, you know, have to be makeshift. You know, like you mentioned, schools mm -hmm. and community space. It's really a community space, a communal space. Yeah. Sorry. And when you make that, when you when yeah, when, when you don't uh, offer sufficient space, um, you know, then it it sends a statement that's beyond just okay. You know, find other places to pray. Uh, it really sends the message of you're not welcomed in this in this community. So, um, right. quite an excellent point. Um, so, I, I, I'd love for, I'd, I'd love for you to also kind of talk about um, you know we, we've talked about the website. I mean, I, I don't know if you mentioned actually the name of the of the uh, the Tumblr space. Oh. Side entrance. So you can you can also get, go to sideentrance.org. Two e's. Um, and it'll take you to the Tumblr site. And I also have a Facebook page with the same name. And I'm always uh, soliciting uh, photographs and, and, and other stories. And one of the things that I did earlier this year and during Ramadan um, on my blog, which is the Introspectives, uh -huh, um, is to start a, a conversation called My Mosque, My Story. And I asked women from all over, really, you know, I had to call out um, everywhere to share their story of, you know, their relationship to the mosque. And, you know, here you can just have this vast array of people uh, who are mosque, unmosque, uh, converts, people, heritage Muslims, people who are raised Muslim, um, Sunni, Shia, Ahmadi, you know, everybody, you know, people who are traveling, people who, you know, young mothers or older mothers. and. That was a really great, um, if I could plug that as well, if you just, you know, I think the hashtag is like my mosque, my story, or you can go to the introspectives page, um, because those are more in-depth. They're like, you know, essays of women's relationships to the mosques and how they, that may have evolved or, or changed as the, their lives went on. Um, and one of my favorite ones, I'll just end with that, is one of my favorite ones of the summer was of a South African woman uh, she and her husband actually drove from South Africa through, you know, various African countries as they're going north, uh, through uh, um, through to Saudi to Saudi Arabia, and then to Jerusalem. And she, you know, shared that journey with us and um, in in her blog, and it, it was just absolutely fantastic for me to see, you know, kind of. Um, how Muslim communities, in, and primarily in Africa, are grappling also with, with these questions. Hmm. I, I, well, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, you know, I, I, I again, I, there's so many things I, I'd love to pick up on. Um, but if I could, then you know, maybe we can sort of talk about now, um, you know, some of the work that you're doing uh, with regards you know, to your involvement with ISNA and, and sort of how does that come about and mm -hmm. 
you know, um, how ISNA as an organization, because again, you, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, you, you know, briefly moments ago, you, you sort of mentioned about how different Muslim organizations, uh, or in the case of just minutes ago, about how different Muslim countries are dealing or grappling with this issue. Certainly Muslim organizations in America, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for better or worse, um, you know, some better than others are grappling with the issue. And so, um, you know, again, ISNA being, as, as, as Zaki mentioned at the very outset of the show, you know, the sort of premier sort of umbrella organization, uh, largest Muslim organization in America, um, love to sort of hear about what ISNA is doing to sort of talk about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's connected actually to the work of side entrance because, I mean, I'm not the first person to be raising up this question of, of women's inclusions. And um, I think what happened was, you know, that film, that the, the film Unmasked also kind of uh, made waves around the same time. And of course, there's always been the work of uh, Sister Aisha Adalia and Dr. Sarah Saeed from Women in Islam Inc. out in New York City, um, where they've been doing research over the last, you know, couple of decades, I think, or a decade and a half, um, where they're actually looking at applied research of um, you know lots that are women inclusive, and um, so I think there was this kind of tidal wave with the work that uh, Sister Aisha and uh, Dr. Sarah were doing. Uh, my work, um, the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, which is a Muslim think tank, was also really interested in kind of the role of the mosque and and not not only you know are women included in the mosque, but you know is the mosque serving its purpose? And you know who's being marginalized, and, and how can us address that? All of these kind of there was this sort of tidal wave of this kind of conversation, both online and offline, a couple of years ago. And I was asked by the ISNIC has uh, like a task force for mosques in general, and you know they do like imam trainings, um, they like they have the Green Mosque Initiative, things like that. And one of their their task forces under this committee uh, is women, you know, task force for women inclusive or women friendly mosques. And um, it's a small task force. It includes, you know, Sister Aisha, Dr. Sarah, as well as Dr. Ehsan Bagdi, um, and uh, uh, Sister Atia Aftab from New Jersey, and myself. And they asked me to to join the task force. I think because. Um, you know, because of the kind of conversation that side entering just started, I would also like to think it's also because you know, um, you know, I didn't want to be on the outside, sort of just complaining. Look at look at how terrible these mosques are. But I was also making a concerted effort to showcase uh, mosques and communities that are actually doing a great job, um, and and really hoping to put their stories out there so that mosques, you know, can learn from one another and share their best practices. So that was kind of why I agreed to be part of the task force because I thought, you know, here's this big national and international organization that has prioritized um, not just you know the role of mosques, but specifically women inclusive mosques as part of their priority for 2014. So that was last year, and you know they began. Um, I mean, they're always hosting like mosque forums, but they began really kind of. Um, Really, kind of putting a magnifying issue, a magnifying glass to this issue, and really working with scholars across the country, uh, and activists, and and women activists across the country, and saying, this is a real problem. Women and girls are not being included. Families are leaving. You know, people our generation, you know, they're not feeling comfortable or welcome. Uh, converts, people who converted to Islam, you know, often see this as a huge barrier to integrating into mosque communities. And I thought, all right, well, I'm not going to be like that person who's always complaining and then not actually doing the work. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, and because I was that, you know, for a long time. I, I was on mosques and I was, you know, doing my thing. And it was easier for me to do my um, activism online than it was, you know, to actually be in the rooms or on those phone calls and talking across generations, across you know, social political concerns across ethnic backgrounds to really kind of get at this question. Um, and so ISMA has prioritized this, this issue for a lot of reasons. Um, I think we've covered a whole lot of them already. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, what we decided to do earlier this year was we said, well, okay, we have to start off with the foundation of FIP, of 
you know, what does Islamic law, what what does, you know, what was the example of the Prophet's mosque, what was that? And we wanted to get Islamic scholars to, to sort of to sign off, essentially, on the statement and say, well, we know what the Prophet's mosque looked like. We know what um, the Quran says about women's equality in terms of, you know, women and men, every adult Muslim human being has the same spiritual responsibility as one another, right? right? And so we know what what that is. We just want to underscore that, have scholars across the ideological spectrum to uh, you know to agree to that. And so we crafted a statement, and it was you know it was a back and forth kind of a, a methodology or a process um, that took several months. And we received, you know, a unanimous endorsement from the North American Fifth Council, and then we sent out the statement to um, a number of scholars, religious scholars, academic scholars, chaplains, imams across the country to also see whether they would, um, you know, endorse the statement. And many of them did. Many of them gave us feedback, which we tried to include or modify, you know, modify the statement. Uh, based on their feedback, especially if we receive the same uh, type of feedback across a number of scholars. And, um, but this is really just the, the first step. So we had, we had the big launch last weekend at the conference where we said, you know, a number of the scholars and leaders very, spoke very briefly about the importance of, um, of mosques working to include women. Uh, and, and briefly, the statement says that, you know, no mosque should ban women, so women should be able to attend any masjid in, in America. Um, women should be able to pray in the masala, in the sanctuary, without a barrier. Uh, that mosques, you know, will provide that, and if a woman wants to pray in that area, you know, she wouldn't be kicked out. And then that women are involved in the governance, so that, you know, um, that the bylaws don't ban women from running for elected office in a mosque and, and you know the executive committee or the board. And yeah, I think it was Yasser Qadi who said, I can't believe it's 2015 and we were only just saying this and we're only coming to it now. Hmm. But you know, it is what it is. And so that was that was really the first step. And our next steps are, you know, we're gonna be hosting forums across the country, um, kind of explaining it, going more in depth into uh, what the prophets must look like, and you know why why these scholars actually signed on to the statement to give a fifty uh, sort of analysis of the statements, and then also more I guess um, more practical like how how can local communities implement these three goals in the mosques? So, what what kind of uh, pushback have you gotten? Uh, I mean, uh, this is this is obviously uh, an uphill climb, and I mean, yeah. uh, you made a lot of progress, but I mean, obviously, I'm I, I'm sure it hasn't been an easy one. No, it has not been easy. You know, it's it's funny because uh, on on one hand, we get some pushback from people who say, "Well, we're unmasked, and what is not." You know, has to say this ISMA statement is too little, too late. It doesn't affect me because I'm not in a mosque anyway. Or, um, you know, or like we, we don't really need to listen. Like, do we really need ISMA to say this? We're already doing this on our own. So that was that was one interesting pushback that I actually hadn't anticipated. I had anticipated um, the pushback of you know people really kind of not knowing what to do with the goal of having women pray without a barrier in the main hall because that I anticipated and I think we're, we're continuing to get pushback on that. Um, partly because as, as you mentioned, most mosques in America are sort of makeshift or, you know, uh, were built, uh, you know, from community funding and were not necessarily equipped, like just architecturally equipped to, right. to house the entire congregation in one space. Um, and so that's that's kind of like a, a practical uh, obstacle that a lot of mosques are coming up with. But then, you know, there's also the ideological um, medhavi kind of pushback, which is, you know, there are some schools of, of thought that say it's actually better for women to pray at home. And these people are not going to be changing their minds just because, you know, it's not and there are several dozen scholars that have come out with a statement. 
right. You know? and right, so, right. I mean, but I mean, I think, I think if, 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 if I mean, I almost feel like I'd have to interject here and say that, you know, uh, even those met sort of like juristic differences are mm -hmm. informed so much in part uh, or informed to a large extent by local cultural idiosyncrasies that you kind of mentioned at the very, very beginning when you first began talking about the issue, you know? So I think it kind of goes back full circle to a lot of the points you were talking about in terms of, like, the spread of Islam and the Muslim community early on yeah. after the generation of the Prophet. You know, a lot of those sort of cultural practices continue to inform, you know, the differences that you see within the juristic schools, right? So, yeah. um, it's which, which, again, I think which... I, uh, I, you know, I think I think your strategy in terms of having scholars from across ideological spectrum, you know, across the ideological spectrum, uh, you know, address the issue, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis either this statement or you know having these continued conversations around the country now about the fact that you know, look, setting the record straight, as it were. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think there's a huge there's a need to, uh, to be educated because. For so many people, they, they just kind of accept the status quo, and they actually get surprised when you tell them what the Prophet's must actually look like, right? Because they're like, oh, there, there were no barriers? Like, oh, right. oh, that's because because we're so used to the status quo being that women and men pray in completely separate spaces, or women don't attend the mosque at all, that so many, even the congregation, the lay people, um, don't know, you know, what that history is, and actually, exactly. a lot of imams and a lot of, you know, religious leaders might not know either, and so that's, that, you know, that's why we wanted to get the scholars to, on board and say, well, actually, we know what the mosque looked like, we know what the prophet's mosque looked like, and um, and if we want to return to the Quran and Sunnah in this respect, and <laughs> You know, that, whole, that becomes a loaded sort of yeah, yeah. Returning yeah. to the Quran and so now that that, that that comes with its own baggage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I always uh, say, I mean, I always joke to my friends, I'm like, you know, there are all these guys who walk around, you know, with hair just kind of long, and you know, and their beard is dyed with henna, and you know, they got the swag in their pocket, and they've got these short pants. But yeah. when you tell the them, I was say, don't forget the pants. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget the pants and the sandal, the khuf, you know, the oh, Of course, of course, of all course. All of that. Right. And, and, you know, it's like, and they won't eat onions, just all of this. They want to, they love the Prophet <laughs> so much. They want to emulate him in every respect, right. except in the mosque. You know? Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. You know, um, no, you know, and it's funny because, you know, again, I, you know, I just want to be clear when I was saying earlier about the sort of, like, the differences within the juristic school, you know, as mm -hmm. someone who sort of belongs either culturally or by choice to perhaps the largest of sort of the juristic schools being the Hanafi school, you know, mm -hmm. the, even within a particular juristic school, you have differences of opinion. So, for example, yeah. you know, although the, I would argue that, for example, the Hanafi school that, that, that sort of emerges from the subcontinent tends to be a little bit slightly more conservative on matters of, like, like you mentioned, like, you know, arguing that it's better for women to pray, you know, at their homes than rather than mm -hmm. coming to the mosque and so on. But even within that, even within the school, though, if you take, for example, the Hanafi school from the Levant, uh, for example, far mm -hmm. more, quote unquote, liberal or progressive when it comes to matters of gender. So, you know, again, you know, I think uh, it's a matter of Muslim literacy, right? And I think that's why, again, going back, and I don't want to keep repeating myself, but like really commending the work that you're doing or the approach that you've taken with regards to getting these scholars on board and saying, look, you know, let's increase the level the level of of uh, Muslim literacy uh, mm -hmm. around this particular issue. So, yeah, that's a, I think that's a great point. Well, in 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 broader terms, now obviously we're we're, we're focusing in uh, specifically on on the issues of, of women's space and, and uh, Isna's role in that. Uh, I would love if you could talk in broader terms uh, about uh, Isna's role in, in the, I mean, in the American Muslim experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we just finished, um, we, we just finished the, the annual convention and the hashtag was Isna52 Chicago, which altogether too long hashtag, but um, but it, you know, it goes to hey, it you know, that, yeah. 
It does remind so, yeah. me that it's been 52 years. It's been 52 exactly. conventions, so there you go. And yeah, I mean, I, by the way, do you have any numbers around or, or metrics around how many how many of those 52 have been in in Chicago? <laughs> no, that, that I don't know. I think probably, I don't know. It, it seems like half of them were. Half of them. I, I mean, good half of them, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, it started off as MSA, as, as a Muslim Student Association. And so right. actually counting, you know, some of those annual conferences as part of the 52 yeah. years. So, but, but either way, I mean, it's, ISNA is, um, you know, it was an organization that was started by primarily immigrant origin Muslim students from across you know, the Muslim majority world, um, you know, after 1965, you know, after the 1960s when a lot more, um, you know, immigrants from non-European countries were able to come to the U.S., we got a lot more Muslims, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and they started it, and I think what you see over the last 52 years is a real evolution. And I, and I know, you know, a lot of, a lot of people in, in my generation, a lot of people that I grew up with, grew up attending ISNAs, you know, like going to the conferences and, you know, possibly being connected to MSA or MINA, which is the youth kind of organization, the Muslim youth of North America. Um, and then, you know, over the last few years, especially post 9-11, feeling like, well, this is, this organization is kind of irrelevant because, you know, what is the role of a quote-unquote umbrella organization if you, the Muslim community in the U.S. is the most diverse, you know, Muslim community in the world, you know, and, and that's the thing, I mean, I I do a lot of work uh, transatlantically as well, so, you know, I work in, in Western Europe a lot with uh, primarily Muslim communities, and oftentimes the story you hear is kind of, um, it's not really nuanced, they will say, oh, the Muslim community in the U.S. is wealthy and educated, well integrated, and, you know, I'm like, well, that's, that's not, that's one story, that's one narrative of the Muslim community. Um, the Muslim communities, and I always say communities, are very diverse. So what does it mean to have an organization like ISNA that really wants to be, you know, an umbrella organization, right? And so it's, it's a national organization, does not have grassroots chapters. Um, and, you know, so so because of that, there there's some assets, there's some really great positive things to be to being a national organization. They, they have kind of a 20,000 foot uh, perspective. They can identify some trends that are happening across the country. Um, they got like a national network of scholars and leaders and activists. But at the same time, because they're not grassroots, um, you know, that local implementation of the work that ISNA does nationally is not always there. There is sometimes a disconnect between, you know, the sort of the, the national movement um, and, and the local movement. And especially, you know, after 9-11 where um, now you have like almost three different uh, generations sort of, I don't want to say competing, but let's say three different generations who are out there uh, creating, let's say, different Muslim narratives, the baby boomers, you know, Generation Xers, and the millennials. And each of these three, you know, uh, generations have their own baggage, let's say, baggage with ISNA, baggage with, you know, being, you know, what American identity means, um, this post 9-11 identity that millennials have is not something that I think Generation Xers share, um, this sort of ambivalence about, you know, hyphenated identities that many Generation Xers have uh, is not something that millennials share, you know, by and large, I'm, I'm, I know I'm saying these huge kind of blanket statements, but what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, that you do have some generational pushes and pulls, um, and then you have, obviously, the racial demographic, the racial dynamic where the U.S. Muslim community is the most racially diverse religious community in the U.S. Um, we're economically very diverse. I remember reading some study that says the top four, uh, the top four occupations of American Muslims are doctor, engineer, small business owner, and taxi driver. And when you see these four things, you say, oh yeah, the four different type generally, you know, different levels of education, different um, economic background. And now we have a large refugee populations that have been coming, you know, from the 2000s and late 90s and 2000s with their own, um, you know, kind of 
their own issues that, that, that they need to be dealing with. And so when you have that, <laughs> you know, this is the state of the Muslim communities in the U.S., well, it doesn't really mean anything to say that there's one national organization that's the umbrella organization. Now, I, I don't know. I think, I, I think it's a good debate to have. I obviously am leaning toward, yeah, you know, there is a positive that ISNA and other national organizations um, can offer. I mean, just even offering a platform, offering a network, um, being able to, to sort of connect people um, who might not otherwise have ever been connected. You know, instead of people in New Jersey reinventing the wheel, they can see, oh, what are folks in Atlanta doing? What are folks in California doing? Um, and so I think that ISMA as an umbrella or national umbrella organization definitely can offer that role as well, like, you know, being this kind of um, this sort of a national organization that is not necessarily uh, in the weeds so much with local stuff, uh, you know, can can then be able to to share some of the the, the, the meta story or the macro story of of the American Muslim communities. I, I yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think you 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 raised some excellent points, really, because I you know uh, things that I've not only been thinking about, but also things that I haven't really been sort of thinking about. But if, but if I if I could say, you know, when when you were talking about, for example the idiosyncratic differences between, say, the millennials, Generation Xers, the baby boomers, you know, mm -hmm. the, on, the, on the flip side of that or the, uh, the other side of that, the one constant we do have, though, is sort of ISNA, which is remarkable, <laughs> right? I mean, the yeah. fact that here is an organization that has it been in existence throughout that entire historic, you know, that, 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 that intergenerational uh, uh, historical, you know, period. So, yeah. so that's fascinating. I mean, that alone, I think, is a testimony to the yeah. fact, or, or to to the role that ISNA has to offer. Uh, and if I could also say, you know, in, in sort of in addition to that, I think that ISNA also, if nothing else, uh, and I remember being on a panel once, and I was actually moderating the panel at ISNA. You know, and 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 uh, after the end of the panel, you know, you usually have enough time, or you try to have enough time for question and answers. Mm -hmm. And it, we had someone from the audience who got up, and you know, they began sort of deriding, and you know, you know, and they had some criticisms for Isna, you know. And I and I just remember interjecting as a response. I said, "Look, we, we, you know, I think we all appreciate your you your feedback and your thoughts." Uh, and and again, I wasn't speaking at the behest of Isna or on behalf of Isna. But just realizing that, look, at the very least, let us all at least acknowledge that ISNA provides a forum, a platform for us to have yeah. this open conversation, right? And this open conversation and, and, and exchange of ideas. Um, what I would say a little bit, and again, I, I think I'm speaking to the right person, if I could push back perhaps a little on, on, on some of the points that you made, but I think you raised this issue, but I feel that if ISNA only were to do more with regards to uh, trying to get a sense of what other communities are doing and, and then having mm -hmm. those sort of diverse viewpoints um, represented at least at the, at the national level vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the ISNA convention. Uh, and, I, and I know work's being done in that direction, but I think that would be a great step forward, right? Because for far too long, it's been, well, ISNA's plugged into communities where we have ISNA chapters, as it were, or ISNA affiliates. Mm -hmm. Not so much uh, in communities where you have an absence of quote unquote ISNA affiliates or ISNA chapters. Does that make sense? Ken? Oh, yeah. Gosh, yes. I mean, I there there are so many things. I mean, I actually think that this year's convention was was pretty uh, was pretty good in terms of you know, this representation. But there are some really long-standing issues that. The Muslim community is in the U.S. Uh, and, and ISNA is kind of, in, in many ways, um, representing that, have really not yet kind of stood up to, to challenge. Um, and, and, you know, I've written about this in the past where I said, you know, the three main issues that are affecting the Muslim communities in the U.S. are uh, racism, sexism, and sectarianism. And um, I, I would say that you know, the sexism, this misogyny piece, this, this question of like where women, um, you know, what role women play in Muslim communities, 
that's something that ISNET is really trying to kind of elevate. And you know, you you saw it this year where we had over eighty percent, over eighty women speakers. And I should also say, um, I was on the program committee, so I was actually I was that person on the program committee when we would get. Um, like a, a proposal, we're looking at a proposal, and I'd be like, ah, they're all Daisy men, no, like we need we need an Arab lady on there, you know, like I was that person because we really wanted to make sure that the every single panel was as diverse as it possibly could be, not just for the sake of diversity, but because mm -hmm. we know that people are coming in from different, um, with different values added to the conversation. And so, you know, right. this year you, you definitely saw that on, on the main stage as well as on you know, the parallel right. sessions for women. But the other two questions are huge, which is sectarianism, yes. massive, you know, and exactly. and unfortunately, like, what's happening in, you know, what happens in, in, in Pakistan, what happens in the Middle East, in Iraq, and Syria, it bleeds almost sometimes literally here, <laughs> to the Muslim communities here in the U.S. And... You know, I often describe ISMA as like a umbrella Sunni organization, even though I know like some of the founders are not Sunni or you know, they're Shia, and, and they, you know, ISMA won't say, oh, we're only here for the Sunnis. They say that they're here for all the Muslims, but it's generally a Sunni organization. And, um, you know, and I think this is something and that we really, yeah. I'm sorry. I was just going to say because I think you're being I think you're being forthcoming and 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 sort of you know I I would also maybe uh, add to that that not only is it and even within being a Sunni organization representing a certain or or a uh, certain param let's 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 say parameter of an ideological perimeter or what what's the word parameter yes. sorry, of an ideological yeah. system, right I mean without Absolutely. I don't want to yeah. name names but you know, I think yeah. we all know what we're talking about right so <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, but I think that's but but the fact that it, it's there, I, I feel a sense of like relief just knowing that the leadership is thinking about this issue. That you know beyond just being okay, let, let's have representation from you know both genders at the very least, and and then right, also right. You know, across cultural lines. But hey, across ideological lines, even within the Sunni tradition and from yeah. without the Sunni tradition, outside of. The I mean, I think I think yeah. it's evolving, right? I mean, yeah. I think that that everyone identifies like yeah these are real issues we need to Excellent. tackle them but at the same time like it's sensitive and it's a sensitive issue for so many people so it's a visceral you know um, question for a lot of people and, and you know I think we saw that last year uh, when Ismail the convention was hosted in Detroit there was a, a, a Sunni Shia um, panel that got quite heated <laughs> at the end because you know people's emotions are there but what I think is really really critical is you know that the the leadership maybe not uniformly but many in this in the leadership um, mm -hmm. are, have identified this is actually this is something that you know, a lot of Muslim communities um, and a lot of families are mixed families right and like it's you know yeah. in America in the larger scheme of things nobody's gonna say are you Maliki are you Hanafi are you Itna Ashari like nobody's gonna ask about like what "Quote unquote," what kind of Muslim are you, right? Um, they don't really care about that stuff. No, so I within agree. Muslim communities, like we really need to kind of step up and, and kind of build that brotherhood and sisterhood. And and we did have that. We did have Shia speakers um, and and Shia convention goers who, who were there. Uh, the other the other point I wanted to mention is is race and racism. Yeah. Um, it's not got a lot of heat, and I think rightfully so. Earlier this year. For um, some, uh, for the response around uh, the Baltimore yes. uh, situation, um, and you right. know, that's a again, great. I, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I was very upset. You know, I, I'm from Africa. My, my parents are from Africa. I identify as a, a black person, as an African person. You know, I'm not African American. Uh, but I identify with African Americans, um, you know, like my male cousins walking down the street. Nobody asks them, "Where were you born? Where were you born?" Right. No, they're they're like, "Oh, it's a black guy." They you are know, a black right, male, danger, right? Yeah. Young mm -hmm. black male, right? And mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. I'm always terrified for them. I'm always like, "Oh my God!" Like I just want to hear that they're okay. I want to make sure that they're okay, especially because you know, well, that's a whole other discussion, but it, and a lot of immigrant black communities, 
you know, our parents don't necessarily know, you know, how to talk to their sons about being young black men in America, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the, this, the, the question around not just Baltimore, but just in general, right? I mean, we always say, or at least my friends and I always say, like, what, what a downright shame that there are two huge national conventions that are happening in Chicago on the same weekend every year. Right, and and so like I'm talking about the Mosque Cares Convention. This is from Imam Latifi Muhammad's community. It's hosted every Labor Day weekend, which you know they hosted that even before ISNA became a thing, um, and and it's always hosted here in Chicago. And people always say, oh, you know, we sh we can have you know, if you if you go to that convention, you can come to our convention, you know, with no registration fees or anything like that. But it's clear across. The city in Chicago is a massive, massive city. It's not exactly easy to go from one convention to the next. So, but then what you see is a sort of systematic erasure in many ways of um, of of the the of the experiences of African American Muslims, and it was expe especially highlighted this year because of you know, the national conversation around Black Lives Matter, the 50th anniversary of you know the March on Selma and the Civil Rights Movement, you know, just uh, the, the sort of that national conversation is bleeding into um, the Muslim community and yeah. you know Muslims, you know, saying, well, wait a minute, you know, one of the, one, um, the campaign that was launched over Ramadan um, that raised over $100,000 to repair black churches in the south that were burned, um, on their website, on, on the launch good website, um, you know, they said, let's remember that the black community and the Muslim community are actually one and the same in the U.S. And, you know, I would just, I'm just looking forward to the day where, you know, leadership, the immigrant origin leadership whether it's at ISNA or any other immigrant-led um, organization, can mm -hmm. really internalize that. Like Absolutely. not just to say, oh, Muslims have been here since you know the time of slavery, but then you know, like they can tell you about you know Jefferson's Quran, but they don't know, but they've never invited an African American Muslim person. Exactly. To come there's a lot of their house. Right. You know? There's a lot. There's a lot of tokenism, yeah, that happens in our communities, and I think that uh, I, I think you raise a great point, and 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 I think I'd be remiss not to, you know, like I remember when Imam Suhaib Webb, you know, came out, you know, he was he was in the Bay Area a, a few, a, a few uh, maybe a couple of months ago, and they asked him about, you know, the the sort of well, what can we do as the Muslim community to you know, be more, you know, to, to, to help integrate or, or to help connect with the larger struggle of race in America. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you know what, just follow the leadership of the black community. That's all we can do, you yeah. know, and say, yeah. like, look, yeah. how can we help? And, you know, he, he I remember he, sp he spoke specifically about the hashtag, like, Black Lives Matter. And he's like, let's, mm -hmm. you know, like, that alone as, as opposed to, like, Sort of uh, uh, what's the word? Um, appropriating it and making it all lives matter yeah. or Muslim lives oh, matter. Gosh, yeah. You know, right? I mean, just just just, yeah, just follow yeah. their lead. Follow their lead, right? Yeah, exactly. Follow the lead, and, and like you're saying, like don't don't tokenize as right. an American Muslim. Right. I mean, and 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 you know, the relationship shouldn't be one of charity. Oh, like yeah, like that that poor mosque on the south side. Like we'll 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 donate to them during Ramadan. Like no, like. They're your equals in faith and humanity, right. and you, you you should interact with them in that way. And I think I, I think what happened, you know, over especially like the Baltimore statement with Isma is that it really kind of came to to light the evolving nature of the leadership within um, within Isma itself, um, and within you know the within or, or I would say among. Um, Muslim leaders from our generation who are not necessarily connected to larger organizations, but who have uh, a platform like, let's say, online platform, because um, you know that was really something that really affected and offended and hurt a lot of people, not just African Americans either. A lot of Muslims who were just very shocked and and dismayed and and hurt by the statement. Um, I'm glad that Isna retracted it and apologized and all of that, but the fact that it happened, even you know, to begin with, 
it just goes to show you that you know we it's a it's a really long road. Um, we the Muslim communities in the U.S. you know have to have to start talking to each other and learning from one another as equals in faith and equals in humanity because that's I mean that's that's a real deal right I mean like I was talking about earlier in terms of racism sexism and sectarianism mm -hmm. it's because people don't interact with each other as equals in faith um, well you know if if if, if anything if, if you know if, if we can have the national convention or and, and not to say that's the only thing that ISNA does right but mm -hmm. if we're just sort of highlighting that if the national convention can represent an opportunity for us to even uh, play out some of the conversations that happen on the internet, because the great equalizer and a lot of of what you're talking about is online, right? We yeah. we, we engage yeah. in these conversations online. We're having an honest conversation, so for example, about the about the BDS movement and MLI. Mm -hmm. We're having mm -hmm. online conversations about. Mipsters. What you know, we're having online yeah. conversations about whatever there is, and I mentioned these specific CBE. ones because I know, right, Stevie, <laughs> right, because I know that you've been a part of it. Previous right. guests that we've had, like Harun Mogul, Wajahat Ali, uh, uh, Rabia Choudhury, are all you know. We're, we're having these conversations. You know, allow for ISNA, uh, or at least the national right. convention, to, to 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 really highlight those and 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 yeah. have those debates play out in front of the larger community. That may not be online. Do you know what I mean? There was a really great debate that was hosted. That was uh, kind of moderated. Oh yeah, by the ISPU, ISPU debate. It was. And it's already, uh, yeah, it's already up on YouTube. Yeah, I've seen it. Excellent. It, it's, yeah, it's excellent. I do want to say that I was not, I was not part of NLI, <laughs> so I just wanted to. <laughs> You're like. And it was, for the record. People, yeah, for the record, because I, because I do I do do interfaith. I am an interfaith activist, but I was not uh, invited to be part of NLI, and I wasn't part of it. You know, his, um, I, and, and I, I don't want to, because that's gonna, that, that's almost like an entirely, that's like, a, that's an episode or a podcast episode in and of itself. No, let's save uh, that for sweeps. I, I, but yeah, it, <laughs> let's save that for sweeps, right? Yeah. But I will say that, uh, or, or I should point out at least to our listeners that it hasn't been by intent or choice on the part of Zucky or myself to only have had on guests who, let's say, quote unquote, are on the pro side of the. MLI debate. I just want to make that uh -huh. right, Zucky. I don't want to speak for you, but that hasn't been by design. That's just been by circumstance. It's just it's just kind of happened. I mean, I yeah. I think that that this is you know for, for me personally, and again, as you said, I don't we don't want to dive down this rabbit hole. Because... Right, and I don't want I don't want him to be like, hey, we'll have you on. The, you know, we have we, yeah. we we got you on the show. Please comment on you know that. So. Uh, sorry, go ahead. The, hot, the hot button yeah. issue of the day. There you go. There you go. Finish your point, Zaki. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. No, I I I have my own personal opinions about that whole thing, but having had on uh, multiple people who've who've been, participated, I I can absolutely see where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. Um. I'm, no, agree, I'm trying. I'm I'm trying to be like. I'm I'm, I'm being like Switzerland here. <laughs> no, no, Zucky. My only point, what I was saying earlier, Zucky, is that is that we haven't. Let's be real. We haven't had on a guest, for example, who has presented the other side. And and my only point in saying that is that that has not been by design on the part of us as 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 or or a part of the the agenda that we're pushing uh, on the show. Because uh, you know, as we've made it clear, I think I at least I hope. 26 episodes into the into the podcast, you know, we try to we, we we try to have on guest whether or not we agree with that particular position or not. We we aren't here to state a position. We're here to just have a conversation and to present as much of the American Muslim narrative as, as possible. So so again, I just that's all I want. I was just putting uh, putting a uh, uh, what's the word? You know, just to, I just wanted to make that as a statement and say, you know, in the future, hopefully, we can have someone on. Who can present the other side and and have that conversation? Uh, yeah, that's I think I that's all I meant. I think you, yeah, I think you definitely should. Uh, yeah, I agree. Be a great conversation. Um, right. Another but, kind of. Uh, uh, well, well, I was just gonna say, like, another thing I really love to do is, you know, I studied international relations when I was in college, and I just always really love to see like how other communities in other you know countries deal with these these questions. Why I'm so interested in my work that I do sometimes in Western Europe. But um, on, specifically in this question around MLI, one interesting kind of um, 
way to look at it, or one lens through which to look at it, is through the experiences of South African Muslims. Um, because that experience has been brought up so many times, um, you know, there, I think that's a really cool kind of way of looking at um, this question, but also it's just really, really informative. This other Muslim community um, that in many ways is, you know, kind of parallel to the U.S. and how they dealt with a situation um, that is similar to the situation that, you know, Palestinians are dealing with. Um, no, I think it's, right, right. No, I think it's a great point. I, I didn't mean to. I think we 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 sort of steered away from the conversation we were having. <laughs> um, yeah. But 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 and that was not by intent. Well, but uh, sorry, and, go ahead. And real quick, um, as we sort of uh, move towards wrapping things up, mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, the interfaith work that you do, and and mm -hmm. um, we're very lucky to have gotten you. Uh, b before you head off, I know you're going to be uh, doing some traveling, so I'd love for you to to. Uh, talk that up a little bit too before we sort of wind things up here. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, several years ago I, I got an opportunity to go to the Netherlands for two weeks, part of a Muslim um, kind of, uh, a tr uh, it's a sort of a, an exchange trip where they had these Dutch Muslims come to the U.S. and learn about immigration and integration in the U.S., um, specifically the Muslim experiences here, and then I was sort of the, the part of the delegation of people who kind of went there uh, because of my interfaith work. Um, and that trip rekindled my interest in looking at different, not just Muslim communities, but just looking at different Western communities and how different Western nations have been dealing with the idea of, you know, the concept of national identities, you know, who gets to say, I'm a Dutch citizen, I'm, I'm a Dutch person, I'm an American, what does that even mean? Um, in a secular, you know, multi-faith, multi-ethnic democracy. So I had the chance to visit, you know, nearly a dozen other countries in, you know, since that time, since 2008 till now, and um, in in Western Europe and uh, in Northern Europe, and it's very very exciting to me because I think um, because those different communities are faced with very similar challenges. To, as to us, right? They're also dealing with a securitized post 9/11 identity. They're also dealing with, you know, second and third and sometimes fourth generation Muslims. You know, trying to figure out their identity, navigating those identities, convert communities, uh, integrating and, and entering into, you know, the existing Muslim paradigms. All these questions about gender and race in, in certain other countries. I mean, there, there are real differences, right? It's not like there's little Americas everywhere. There are real differences to the American experiences, but there are also very, very profound similarities. Um, and so this question of like this post-9/11 securitization of Muslim identities—that's um, something that I'm always very interested in. And one of the things that you mentioned when you introduced me in the beginning um, is, you know, the phrase "civic uh, integration," which has taken on, you know, kind of its own life at, at this point. I should probably go back and change it because uh, uh, the work that I do, I, I, you know, the phrase that I like to use is active citizenship because I think, you know, that that phrase tells the people, you know, who are from. Uh, I'm going. I'm going to Sweden in, um, you know, in November. And that phrase of active citizenship tells the Swedes who are of Muslim origin, Muslim Swedes, and Swedes of you know other origin, whether Jewish or Lutheran or whatever, that everyone has a role to play. This is not just Muslims, you know, kind of giving up what makes them unique and becoming Swedish. It's this question of what does it mean to be Swedish in 2015? Um, and you know, every country that I've visited has had these questions. And each one answers them differently. Um, I'm going on this trip to learn about how um, specifically Somali communities, but other immigrant uh, and refugee communities, have been dealing with um, integration or not integration. Um, you know, are they active citizens? What does that mean? Um, you know, what's their relationship with law enforcement, for example? And you know, to me, to me, it's very interesting. Because uh, as long as the U.S. and European countries look at their Muslim communities, their actual Muslim citizens, through 
their lens of national security and ISIS and all this other stuff, like, we will never be able to develop as a nation. Like, it's not, I don't think that the onus should be only on Muslim communities to quote-unquote integrate, because integration is a two-way street. Integration by necessity means that, you know, the, the, the country that is welcoming or not welcoming necessarily the, the new citizens is interrogating what does it mean to be a citizen again, right? And the law can say one thing, but culture and society and, and practice is another. And I think that if, if governments look at their Muslim communities solely with the lens of national security, then they're really, I mean, we're just really losing out on developing, um, you know, generations of active citizens who will give back to, you know, their country, but will also, you know, hopefully strengthen their own, um, their own religious or their own ethnic communities. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm. This is my second time going to Sweden. I don't know why they they chose to have us go to Sweden in November. I would much rather have gone in like the summer, but it's okay. Um, oh, it'll that's be too interesting. Bad. That's too yeah. bad you don't get to escape the Chicago winter and go to a warmer place. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I I I was in Sweden last year or the, the year when there was a polar vortex last year. Oh God. I mean, Actually, warmer there than it was in Chicago. I was like, "What?" <laughs> so maybe it's a good thing, Zeki, that you moved to California because um, <laughs> maybe. I, I mean, the North Pole is like warmer than Chicago. I will say, you know, again, uh, <laughs> love to my Chicago peeps. My 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 family lives there, so I can't speak too ill of Chicago. But um, having lived in Chicago, Michigan, and Massachusetts, I will say that. <laughs> There is no winter like a Chicago yeah. winter, man. Oh my uh, God. Or, or no, um, I'm, and I'm rem- I, I forget. I, in sixth grade, I lived in Alaska, and I oh. will say, and even in spite of that, I will still say that the statement that there is nothing like a Chicago winter <laughs> is still is still, it's still the, true. It's still a truer yeah. statement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, hand, I mean, I sorry, I didn't mean to go off on a weather tangent. Um, no, but no. Yeah, we we do. We, we, Azaki and I do count our blessings out here in California in terms of uh, uh, the weather that we do enjoy. Um, uh, but I'm sorry, go, having said that, uh, I did, I did want to say that, you know, we often say this, Zucky, about having our guests back on the show, but I think in the case here, I, you know, we always mean it, but here we really, really mean it. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. No, 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 yeah, we're, we're not just saying, yeah, speaking of tokenism. <laughs> Speaking of tokenism, yeah. well, we don't just say, out. Yeah, yeah, we don't just say that. But uh, no, I think Hind raised so many points that I, I, I'd really just to, would love to talk hours about. Um, but uh, at, uh, alas, I think we're about we're we're getting near that ninety minute mark, so yeah, yeah. don't want to keep <laughs> uh, don't want to keep. Down. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 uh, straight to straight straight to live. Um, but uh, thank you, Hint, so much for raising so many excellent issues. Uh, we really, really want to have you back on, certainly uh, to, 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 if nothing else, to kind of continue the conversation we were having not only around ISNA, but also, you know, some of the stuff you were just talking about in terms of your trip to, uh, to Sweden uh, that's coming up and some of the work you're involved in there. Because I think here in America, as we find ourselves in the midst of the selection cycle again, where mm. you know, politicians make the most careless comments, um, you know, and sort of an uncertain future with regards to, you know, who's going to control the White House, who's going to control some of the sort of political discourse in the country. You know, I think it's a really important conversation for, 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 for Muslims to be having, right, with regards to how do you define being an American citizen? How do you define integration? Yes. How, what do you mean by assimilation? So on and so forth, you know, so... Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. What so are much. what are our yeah what are our rights and what are our responsibilities? Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, you know, as a reminder to the listeners, I also want to say that you know a lot of what we've talked about, or at least some of what we've talked about, we've mentioned organizations like ISPU. Uh, who we've referenced in the past several times. In fact, we've actually worked very closely with them on a number of our past episodes. Um, you know, certainly Hind uh, has talked extensively about ISNA. You know, we want to remind the audience again that we, one of our earliest guests was Dr. Munir Farid, who was a former uh, General Secretary of ISNA. And in fact, on that episode with Dr. Farid, we spoke in depth about ISNA as well. So definitely go back and hear that. 
uh, hear that episode for a refresher. Um, and I know that on my wish list, for example, and uh, you know, I want to have folks like. You know, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Idris Ali, uh, Dr. Mozammo Siddiqui, mm. some of the sort of early founders of that of the of, of of not only ISNA but part of that early MSA generation uh, that really started yeah, started that yeah started that whole conversation. Um, and last but not least, you know, I think a lot of what we've talked about in terms of the place for converts to place a place to have conversations about gender and race. Um, I know an, or, an organization that I know you're familiar with, an organization that I, for full disclosure, am a part of, Talif Collective here, not only in Chicago, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, not only in Chicago, but also in the Bay Area, you know, we try or we do our best to have or to at least create a safe space where those conversations can occur. Exactly, yeah. And thank you guys for doing that work because it's so needed and it's 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 often the space where people who are have completely given up on the mosques and the sort of the institutions and the organizations mm -hmm. um, that exist uh, already, you know, Ta'lif is often, at least in my experience here in Chicago, like that's the space where people find home, you know. Mm, thank you for saying that, Hind. Uh, yeah, and, and again, we've had both Mustafa Davis, uh, Osama Cannon on the show as well, so definitely our listeners um, who have listened to those shows uh, were part of those conversations. So. Uh, Zaki, that's that's really all I wanted to say. But I know if you had some closing thoughts uh, that you wanted to. Well, yeah. I mean, first of all, uh, uh, just to echo what Pervis said, thanks so much, Hin. And I expect we'll be. I have every expectation we'll be continuing this conversation at some point down the line. Um, before we wrap up, as we do uh, with each episode, I want to give you a chance for people to uh, connect with you online. So what, what are some of the venues that you uh, hang out at? Yeah, absolutely. Find me on Twitter. I'm at, at HindMeki, which is my personal one, if you want to hear about Africa and figure skating and politics and race <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But if, you're only, if you only just want to know about what's going on around mosques, you can follow me at, at SideEntrance. Again, those are two E's. Um, and uh, side entrance uh, with a hyphen for, uh, sorry, with an underscore on Instagram. And I have a Facebook page called, you know, facebook.com slash introspectives. That's for um, my blog, and that's where you can find all of the essays, the really fantastic essays from this summer about my mosque, my story. So, yeah, find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash um, introspectives as well. I'm also on side entrance on Facebook, so I'm I'm kind of everywhere. It's too much. Somebody the other day was like, "You should get a Snapchat." I was like, "You know what? No." I just. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say that often we like to link to all the places our guests are available, but I think that would that would that, that might take up too much space here. But uh, no, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. do our best to we'll do our best to at least let our audience know where they can find you and 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 yep. uh, send some links from our Facebook page. Thank you. Uh, speaking of which, Zucky, which is. Uh, Facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence. You can also email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Also, be sure you hit up iTunes and or Stitcher Radio. Leave us a star rating, write, write a review. Uh, if you dig the show, let other people know that you dig it. The more you do that, the more you are able to help us out. This is episode 27, and we've got a lot of fun stuff left. The, the, we, there, there's still a few months left in the year, and we've got a uh, power pack lineup to close out the year. And uh, we hope you'll join us in a couple weeks when we return. Uh, on behalf of our guest, Hin Maki, on behalf of my co-host, Pervez Ahmed, and on behalf of me, Zaki Hassan, this is Diffuse Congruence. Thank you for listening. Thank you.